I'm already lost. <laughs> That's normal, though. Well, my name's Matthew Hawley. I'm from Dayton, Ohio. Yay! And, uh, <laughs> so, um, and uh, I'm part of an assembly there called Miami Valley Bible Church. And we've been, we've been there since 2000, and um, we used to be under the tyrannical read of, uh, lead of David Reed, but uh, th- in 2008, he decided he had had enough and said, it's yours. Now, <laughs> I say that all in jest. Um, but also, we've got a small assembly we're working on in Cincinnati, Ohio. So if you know of anybody in the uh, Cincinnati area who's looking for an assembly we have um we're meeting at a hotel conference room on wednesday nights we have some folks here from from there today so that's a little bit about who i am so let's go ahead and open our bibles to philippians chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 so the theme of the conference is holding forth the word of life. And to be perfectly clear, I'm up here for one reason, and that's just to motivate us into some evangelism and to to think about how can we better get out there and get the gospel out. What are the barriers to getting the gospel out? How do we overcome those barriers? And... um, I would also like to encourage you tomorrow at 4 o'clock to go to the uh, seminar that Dave's going to be doing on evangelism. Uh, We're going to be talking about some ways that guys have been using to get the gospel out there and that we've had some success with and would love for you to be there and ask questions and learn a little bit about it. But as I think about evangelism and I think about all the different ways that we can go out and do evangelism... And I think about the things that get in the way of evangelism and what are the problems? Why, why doesn't evangelism go off sometimes the way we want it to? I, I think about the different ways I've done evangelism in the past and it's been everything from just walking up to somebody to knocking on doors to going to fairs and festivals to early on before I found the grace message, I worked as a missionary with uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship a little bit. And we would just go into neighborhood projects and gather up as many kids as we could, get them together at the playground and give them the gospel. And as I think about all these different methods, I, I ask myself this question, what's the greatest hindrance to getting the gospel preached today? And to be honest, when I think about the greatest hindrance in getting the gospel out there today, if I look at me and I say, hey, what is the greatest hindrance? I, I think it's me. I mean, not, not like me personally, where I'm blocking everybody saying, no, you can't go out and do it. But I think of all the opportunities that I've had to preach the gospel in my life. And I think, well, what went wrong at those opportunities? And generally, it's that I didn't take the opportunity when it came about. And I, I don't know if you look at things that way, but that, that's the way I look at them when I look at them honestly. So when I look at a verse like Philippians chapter 2, and if you're there, verse 16, it says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. I would, I would hope that you would all agree that it's important to hold forth that word of life, to go out and give the gospel to a dying world. So if we take my my thoughts about this, that most of the time the hindrance to the gospel is actually us because we're not seizing the opportunity, we're not redeeming the time when it comes up, I then have to ask myself the question, why don't I do that? Right? Why, Why don't I do that? And... I think that most of us, if I could speak for most of us, it's fear in, in some, some capacity. It's fear of what's going to happen when I share the gospel. And that fear can manifest itself in different things in our head. Have you ever said, well, it's not the right time? 
You ever, you ever told yourself that? Or they might not be ready for it. When you think about those things for a minute, there's a lot of pride and arrogance when I decide to start answering questions for other people. Instead of just going out and giving them the gospel. So if fear is the issue, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and let's talk about fear for a minute. As you're turning to 2 Timothy, I want to direct your mind to David and Goliath. And you're probably like, well, what does David and Goliath have to do with evangelism? Well, if I'm supposed to be up here and motivate you and me as well to go out and do evangelism, to go out and preach the gospel and to get excited about it, I thought, what's the best way to motivate people to do that? And it, it popped in my head about David and Goliath. You see, you had, you had the, the, the Israelites facing the Philistines, and they're scared to death. What got them to chase down the Philistines and to go spoil their tents? What gave them the victory? Well, the thing that they feared got killed, Goliath. David goes up there with his sling, throws a stone, kills him. All of a sudden, everybody's motivated. Right? All right, so that's my thinking. So we're going to take fear of going out and giving the gospel to the people, fear of preaching the gospel, fear of speaking to people about the gospel, and we're going to look at the God-given ways. What has God given us? What tools has He given us so that we don't operate in fear, but we operate from the position of power that we have with the gospel. So 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And verse 7 says this, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So it says God hasn't given us the spirit of fear, but of power and and of love, and a sound mind. Now, when I read that verse, I get excited because of the fact that that verse is in the Bible. And because that verse is in the Bible, that tells me that God knew that I was going to have some issues when it came out to me going out and giving the gospel, right? And He knew that we are going to fear some things. You think about Philippians chapter 1. I think John brought up Philippians last night. And it talks about being terrified, right, by your adversaries. Did God know that it was going to be fearful to go out and preach the gospel? He did. So he gives us these tools. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So what we're going to spend the next... 40 minutes or so looking at is a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sound mind, and how to overcome fear with those things. Because if you look at the verses, you're going to see that those are the things that are in contrast to fear. So those are the things that we have to concentrate on. Those are the things that we've got to plug into our thinking. Those are the things that we have to plug into our life so that when that fear arises... Instead of giving an excuse of why I'm not going to share the gospel with this person, I can go ahead and do it. So let's talk about the first thing. It says of power. When I say power, when I think of power, and hopefully when you think of power, what's the first verse that pops into your head? Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Good. That's exactly where I like it when I don't have to look at my notes. I just ask the questions and... Have you all teach for me. But Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Let's go there. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Says this. Says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And by the way. Being ashamed of something. Is very similar. To being afraid of something. Right. Being ashamed of something. Is is usually hiding from something. Because of the fear of the result. That's going to happen if you share it. So you're ashamed. So he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at this again. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, if you cut down to verse 24, he says this, But unto them which are called, both the Jews and the Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So if we've been given a spirit of power instead of the spirit of fear, what would you say is the most closely related thing that we can come up scripturally with that power that we've been given? The Holy Spirit working through the Word? Yeah, what else? What do the verses tell us? The gospel itself, right? And Christ, the power of God. Think about that for a minute. In the dispensation of grace... There is nothing more powerful than going out and preaching the gospel. Nothing. Think about the situation that the world's in today. And you've got North Korea, right? What does he want? What does Kim Jong-un want? He's sitting there. He wants power. And what's he after? He, he's after the most powerful weapon that he can have. Spiritually, the most powerful weapon there is, is simply the preaching of the gospel. When it comes to a lost world, there is nothing more, and you have it right there in front of you in God's Word. I've got it right here in front of me in God's Word. It's the most powerful thing there is right there at my disposal. I can go out and preach it. We live in a country where we can do this with relatively little opposition. You go out and knock on doors. If, you, if you've ever gone out and knocked on doors, it's an exercise and fun. <laughs> right? uh, especially when we do it at our church, we go out on Sunday afternoons, which I, I think we're gluttons for punishment. But you quickly realize, even in a small manner, what it's like to be the off-scouring of all things under this day, right? You just interrupted a game. <laughs> right? And the look that you get... Is, is why did you why, why did they do that? Now, even though that's that's silly and that's a small example, that look that you get from people that that you 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 don't belong here. We don't want you here. We don't want to listen. That's enough to produce fear. But that doesn't change the fact that what you've got is the gospel. And think about the power of the gospel, just for one minute, and think about the clarity of the gospel alongside of that. Not only do you hopefully understand the simplicity of the gospel, but hopefully you understand how to present it clearly. That's rare. That's rare in Christianity. To have somebody who understands, one, what the gospel is, and two, how to present it clearly. So we've got the gospel. We've got the power. Now, how does that fight fear? That's a legitimate question, right? Because he says he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. So the key lies simply in the gospel itself. And I want you to take a moment to consider the gospel with me. The gospel teaches us that you and I can't do it ourselves, right? But Jesus Christ did it all for us. He was buried, rose again. We trust in that. And we gain salvation. Now, in simply understanding the gospel and applying it to your daily life, you'll find one of the keys to fighting fear in sharing the gospel. And let me explain this. When we think of the gospel, we generally think of the gospel as an event, as a time when I heard it and I understood it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, right? I heard the gospel, I understood it, there it is, I've got it, great. But see, the gospel works in an ongoing manner in our life. Because the same thing that we learned through the gospel to salvation 
is the same thing that we learn how to walk in Christ. Now, let me explain this. And let's, let's do this by going to Romans chapter 6. Go to Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm going to summarize my whole message right now because every point that we're going to make is going to go back to this point. It's simply get out of the way of the gospel. You need to get out of the way of it. So the first thing that the gospel teaches us is that we can't do it on our own. And when we trust that gospel, it says in verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ is raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. What does Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 teach us? Yep. Colossians chapter 3. It says, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Do you know generally why we operate in fear? Because we're worried about what's going to happen to us. The gospel teaches us that we are no longer the issue. That we are dead, and our life is hid where? In Christ. Is that a freeing thought? It's a freeing thought to me that I don't have to worry about this anymore. I don't have to worry about me going out and preaching the gospel because Matt Hawley, the guy who's afraid to go out and do that, he's dead and his life is hidden Christ. What else does the gospel teach us? Romans chapter 6, verse 4 again. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 again says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So not only am I dead, but I have the opportunity to walk in newness of life. So instead of doing things the way I used to think about them in the flesh, I can walk in Christ, realizing my life is hidden, hid in Him, and operate in newness of life. To boil that point down into a simple sentence, it's not, it's, I'm not the issue anymore. Who is the issue? Christ Himself. That helps me eradicate some fear as well, because I'm no longer the issue. I'm dead. My life is hidden in Him. I get to walk in newness of life where he's the issue. Now, there's several verses that say this exact same thing. We can look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Everybody know this verse? Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I... But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's, I'm dead, and he's the issue. I'm dead, Christ is the issue now. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. These are all familiar verses. He tells us, For me to live, verse 21, is Christ, and to die is... How's that for getting rid of some fear? You're dead. Your life's hidden Him. For you to live is Christ. And if your flesh gets killed in the process, it's gain. Man, that helped get rid of fear, right? It sure does. Point number three about how the gospel helps eradicate eradicate fear when it comes to preaching the gospel. I mean, if if we're, we're, we're afraid of things, how does the gospel, how does that power work in our lives on a day to day basis? And that's found in Romans chapter five, verse eight. 
Romans chapter 5, you ever heard this verse? (laughs) I hope so. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The greatest expression of love that has ever happened is Christ dying on the cross for us. Would you agree with that? Him giving Himself for us. Now, Philippians chapter 2 teaches us another wonderful thing. Philippians chapter 2. Go ahead and turn there. And it's related to this. It's, it's related that God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Philippians chapter 2, he tells us this. Paul tells us. In verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So he takes upon himself the form of a servant so that he can come down to this earth and die for your sins. It's the greatest expression of love. Now we're told in Galatians that you and I are no longer servants. What are we? Sons. You know what that gives us the opportunity to do? It gives us the opportunity to act like a son. And if we realize that Christ is our life and we want to act like a son, we're going to let this mind be in us. And that mind is that he took upon himself the form of a servant. So the gospel helps us think through getting through fearful situations. That power, that spirit of power helps us through in three simple ways. And there's probably more, but for the sake of what I'm teaching, I'm just going to give you three simple ways. You're not the issue. Your life is hidden Christ. And now... You're no longer a servant, you're a son. You can act like the son and go out and serve. That's exactly what Philippians 121 said when Paul says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. It says if, I, if I'm going to spend time in the flesh, this is what I got. But I'm not going to do that. See, if the greatest expression of love that was ever expressed to us was in Jesus Christ coming down and dying on the cross for you and I, then the greatest expression of love that we can give to somebody else is actually showing them the gospel. Would you agree with that as well? So, we've not been given a spirit of fear, but we've given a been given a spirit of power, which is very closely associated with the power of the gospel. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And this is a great way to think about this. And this will finish this point. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 6 says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Does that sum up the power of the gospel? We're earthen vessels. That power works through us. 
so that we can make the life of Christ manifest in our flesh. When I think about it that way, it helps me get rid of some fear because I'm no longer the issue. Christ is the issue, and now I get to go out and serve Christ. I'm not the issue anymore. I can get out of the way of the gospel. Now, we just talked about love as far as the gospel. I want to talk about love. He's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. So let's talk about how love helps us get rid of fear. We know that Romans chapter 5, verse 8 teaches us that God commendeth his love toward us. And we know that we can go out and commend our love toward men by giving them the gospel. And that going out and giving people the gospel, giving lost souls the gospel, no matter what the cost, is a very loving thing to do whether the world thinks so or not. Now, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says this. In verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Do you see how the love of Christ constrains us? Now, that's the love of Christ, right? The love that he has for us. And it constrains us. And it shows us what it does, that henceforth we know no man after the flesh. Verse 15, And he that died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let me give you a little bit of a problem when it comes to fear in preaching the gospel. Many times when we go out and we're going to preach the gospel or give to the gospel to people, I talk to you about answering questions for people, right? Well, they don't want to hear it. We just answer the questions for them. But sometimes we categorize people instead of thinking about people in love in, in the way that they are actually are. Instead of thinking about them based on their eternal state. Correct? You ever get angry with people? get angry with people. Is it a great time to share a gospel? I'm so mad at you. I'm going to share the gospel. No, <laughs> it doesn't really work that way, does it? Many times we go out and we fear the people that we're going to share the gospel with when we should just be operating in love and going out and sharing the gospel with them. Let me give you some verses that encourage me in that regard. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Sometimes it's hard to love people, right? Just ask my wife. <laughs> She'll tell you all about it. But it, it is. And when we read 1 Timothy chapter 2, many times we hear verse 4. Quoted, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's a great verse to quote. That verse comes after some verses. And if we start in verse 1, it says, I exhort therefore, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority. That's where it gets really tough, right? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. When I read that and I get to verse 4 and I hear about all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, it makes me think that the verses prior to that had something to do with it. In this regard, when I pray and make supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men, for kings that are in authority, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, 
who will have all men to be saved. It seems to me that the purpose of doing all that is to get the gospel out, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And what happens is when I go out in love and I make supplications and prayers and intercessions for all men, it focuses my heart and aligns it with the word of God and starts to give me a heart for the souls of men. Do you you see that there? It changes the way you think about people when you pray for them biblically. Which brings us to, if I'm going to love somebody and I want them to be saved, what am I going to do? What's the easiest thing to do? One, I'm going to pray for them, right? But number two, what am I going to do? Just give them the gospel. You see, when we don't pray and make intercessions and supplications for men according to the scriptures, the way that we're supposed to, we end up categorizing them. They're liberal. I don't want to talk to them. Right? We're answering the question for them again. They're not going to want to hear the gospel. Instead of letting the power out to do the work. Another passage that helps me get through and think about men with love when it comes to fear. If you're going to go out and share the gospel with people, there's going to be times where it's fearful. Go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Sometimes it's fearful. When we understand that we have the power, we understand that we're not the issue, that we can walk in newness of life, and we have the opportunity to be a servant and go out and share the gospel, that helps eradicate fear. Point number two, when we love men and realize that they actually need the gospel and we want to operate in charity, what's the bond of perfectness? According to Colossians chapter 3, charity. When I realize I need to go out and operate that way, if I'm going to have a heart for the souls of men, we've got to realize that the way we operate makes a difference. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says this, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. When Paul says, be gentle unto all men, does that remind you of the way he treated the Corinthians? It does me, right? Was he gentle with them? He was. Did he operate out of love with them? He did. But it says in this, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When you think about men out in the world, in the course of this world, Ephesians chapter 2, they are actively in the process of opposing themselves. Romans teaches us that they're building up wrath until the day of wrath. Looking at that charitably is looking at them and saying, this person needs the gospel. Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I think about that, and I think about that picture. You think about the picture of something in a snare. What's it doing? It's opposing itself. It's fighting, and as a fights, it's just tightening and tightening and tightening. The more it works, the worse it gets. As a minister operating in love, we can go out and present to the gospel to people who are opposing themselves. And I think back to the illustration of an animal in a snare. If you're going to go free something out of a snare, is there a chance you're going to get bit? There's a good chance you're going to get bit. Does that make it any the less the right thing to do? It doesn't. So when we operate in love and we think about men scripturally the way we should think about them, it helps eradicate fear because it shows the purpose behind what we're doing. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. One last illustration for love. When you think about 
operating in love. We've had two illustrations. We've, we've, we've learned that we need to set our heart right towards men, and one of the ways that we can do that is through prayer. We've seen that men oppose themselves. And we can look at them because, do we oppose ourselves? Yeah, we do. And we can look at men in love and, and go out and give them the gospel. The other thing to consider is that they're blinded. Isn't that what Second Corinthians chapter 4 teaches us? That they're blinded. When you think about people that way, it softens the way you're going to deal with them, doesn't it? It helps soften the fear of how they're going to react to you because you can see them scripturally for their true state. First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, when you read the whole epistle of 2 Timothy, you get the idea that Paul's really given Timothy a motivational speech. Stay in the game. Endure hardness. Be a partaker of the affliction. He, he's not pulling any punches. He's telling them it's going to be hard, but he's letting them know that God's given you everything that you need to deal with this. His grace is sufficient. And he goes through very masterfully and lays that out for him. But I've got to chuckle when Paul says he's given us a sit down mind because you read his resume. Here's a guy that had everything he wanted, correct? You look at Philippians chapter 3. And religiously, he had everything that he wanted. And then you look at his next resume. Well, it's hunger, persecution, suffering, shipwreck. And here's a guy that says, look, he's given us a sound mind. Now, wait a minute. It doesn't sound very sound that you traded that for that at all. So I, I get a little bit of a chuckle out of that when he says to Timothy, hey, he's given us this sound mind. But he has given us a sound mind. And the truth of the matter is, is our flesh does not see reality the way it should be seen. Only when we look at the world through the word of God, can we get a true picture of what is going on. Having that understanding and operating in the renewed mind, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind, we can operate with a sound mind based off the Word of God, which allows us to see things for what they really are and not for what the flesh sees them as. That's huge in getting rid of fear. Let me give you some examples for this. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Let's just review that real quick. Verses 4 through 8. Paul says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Here's a great passage about how your flesh and how the world sees things completely wrong. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God, by the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. When you read that passage, what that tells you is the world looks at what you and I do. We're going to spend a week here studying the Bible, okay? The world looks at that and says, that's foolish. Hey, we're going to go out and we're going to preach the gospel. Well, that's foolish. But the truth is, is when we look at those things through the eyes of the word of God, when we look at them with the renewed mind, with a sound mind, we realize it's exactly opposite of what the world thinks it is. And many times the same thing for us, if we're operating by thinking in the flesh about things, we need to look at it with that sound mind because it might be completely opposite. Think about 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul has a thorn in the flesh and it's buffeting him and he wants it gone. Why? So he can do ministry better. That's what the flesh says. What does God say? My grace is sufficient. That's what the sound mind says. They're two different things. But the sound mind is the correct. It's the truth. It's the reality of the matter. When we look at going out and preaching the gospel in the sound mind, we get to participate in the most special, fulfilling thing there is for us possibly to do on the face of the earth. To go out and share the gospel with others. That helps eradicate a little bit of fear, doesn't it? I've got this, this powerful thing. I'm no longer the issue. My life is hidden Christ. I can now act like a servant and go out and preach the gospel. Instead of fearing men, I can love them and look at them the way God did. In Romans chapter 5 verse 8, by commending his love towards them. And I can look at all this from the eyes of the scriptures with a sound mind. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 18. Now, one thing I, I harp on in my assembly a lot is when you study out doctrine like this, it's always wonderful to have a case study. Because the scripture, whenever it teaches us doctrine, it's going to give us a case study where we can look at it and say, hey, does what I think I'm seeing here play out anywhere else in the scriptures? And then I look for something and I look to see if I can find that thinking. If he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love and of a sound mind, can I find a concrete place where I see him eradicate fear with power, love and a sound mind and trace that in what he says? And I think you can in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, we're going to start in verse 7. We're going to go all the way through verse 18 and we're going to stop when we find out some things that we've studied here. He says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Did we learn about anything that that... We're not the issue, right? Who's the issue? Christ. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. That's all talking about fearful things. 
things that we could be afraid of, things that could happen to us when we go out and preach the gospel. Verse 10, always a bearing, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus Christ might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto, Jesus, unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Again, we're not the issue. He is. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. You know what he's saying there? He's talking about the persecutions that he goes through in the flesh. That death is working in him, right? Why is he doing it? So that he can hold forth the word of life to who? The Corinthians. What's he doing? He's operating in love. Verse 13, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written. I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Look at verse 15. For all things are for your sakes. He's operating out of love. That the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Again, he's the issue. With all that in mind, he comes to verse 16. For this cause we faint not. Do men faint in fear of what's going to happen? We do. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now look at verse 18. This might be the ultimate sound mind verse. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The sound mind operates with eternity in mind. The sound mind operates not on the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. How do we see things that are unseen? How? By faith faith in the Word. By the renewing of our mind. By operating in that. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter one, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Did you notice something in what we just read? Paul, again, after verse 7, demonstrated all the contents of verse 7 in the next four verses. Let's look at it. Verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. What's that about? Good. But be thou partakers of the affliction of the gospel according to the power of God. (laughs) A little bit obvious there. Verse 9. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. We learned about that this morning. But that's you're not the issue. He's the issue. 
Now look at the next verse. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. You ever just think about the simple fact that here's a guy who was circumcised the eighth day and you go through the Philippians chapter 3 resume? What do you think he thought of Gentiles? That's right. Before in his flesh, he thought about them as dogs. Now, his whole life is dedicated to bringing them the gospel. Is that an example of love? Is that an example of the gospel working out in somebody's life? It sure is. And it shows you the service that he has. You can't come to those kinds of conclusions without a sound mind, according to the scripture. Or if you're out of your mind, according to the world. (laughs) I hope you're out of your mind, according to the world, and are going to operate according to the sound mind. So to review and we'll close. We haven't been given a spirit of fear. And generally, I believe, when I look at my life, That's the biggest hindrance to the gospel getting out. Not the methods that I'm using, not you name it. Not people don't want to hear it. It's that I operate in fear. Instead of operating out of power, understanding the gospel. Not only understanding the gospel when it comes to salvation, but understanding the gospel and how it works through the rest of my life. Of that I'm no longer the issue. Christ is my life. And now I can operate as a servant and go out and serve the Lord by taking the gospels to others in love. Changing my opinion of the men around me according to the word so that I can go out and operate and love them by giving them the gospel. And doing this according to a renewed and sound mind and looking at them through the reality of the God, God's word. When we think about things that way, it helps get rid of the fear. And we can decide to go out and be a partaker of the affliction and preach the gospel, regardless of what happens. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What do you have to lose? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it. We thank you for the power of the gospel. We thank you that you've given us all these tools. We thank you that you knew we would need them. In your name we pray. Amen.